the Polyglot Gathering is brought to you by italki. Become fluent in any language. Today's topic is how to teach and learn 10 languages, up to 10 languages in one course. So, um, I would like to start off by asking, who is more interested in this talk from a, a teacher's point of view? Can you please raise a hand? Okay. So I guess the other ones from a student's point of view, yeah? Okay. So what, what are we going to talk about? So first of all, how it works. Um, so language combina combination, uh, type of students, uh, lesson structure, course material. Of course, we're also going to talk about uh, the advantages for both the students and the teachers. I'm going to show you some practical examples um, and uh, uh, two short interviews. So, some of you may be wondering, is it really possible to learn up to 10 languages simultaneously in one course? I really think so, and not only for polyglots. Um, so, polyglots already learn many languages at the in the same period of time. But do they really learn uh, languages simultaneously, like really the same time? So multilingual courses are really about uh, comparing languages uh, all the time and switching from one language to the other. But why students should, yeah? Ah, sorry, I'm too tall. No one told me that so far. <laughs> I don't know, can you think? Okay, so why students should bother? So first of all, because um, it's a very good method not to mix up languages. Uh, I don't know whether you had this experience, but let's say someone who is learning Italian and also Spanish and is not their mother tongue, normally they tend to mix up the two languages because uh, they are very similar. Um, the second reason is because you could learn uh, the languages much faster. So now instead of 10, you would be speaking 40. No, I'm joking, but maybe. Okay, and uh, of course, um, so you would uh, obtain higher mental flexibility and uh, um, because you will be uh, switching from one language to the other and you would improve your analytical skills because you would com be comparing uh, languages all the time. For those of, uh, sorry, not for, you, um, not for polyglots, but for people who normally go to language uh, classes, normally, um, so it would, this type of course would also help to improve their uh, feeling for languages. And later, if they just want to focus on one particular language, they would be pick it up much, much faster because they are used to this comparing and understanding the logic of languages. And uh, uh, in general, in a country as a whole, of course, those courses uh, would also improve uh, like uh, mutual understanding between cultures. Of course, the more you know a language, the more you're into it also from the cultural point of view. And uh, um, it goes without saying that, of course, would be much better, so it would enhance uh, your job opportunities. So, when I said that you could learn it much faster, what I mean? What do I mean? I, I mean that um, it depends on you. Of course, anyone has his own pace to learn language, but in the same amount of time, you would be uh, you would learn you would normally uh, learn one language. You can learn like five. Um, okay, and so how does it work? Let's say, um, as far as the group courses are concerned, so I would normally suggest, I would um, recommend teaching up to five languages. It's possible up to 10, but it, uh, of course it would be better maybe for polyglots 10 or for people who are really interested in all the languages. Because um, mm, I have several five language uh, uh, courses, and I watch the advantage is that uh, first of all, students do have the time to do their own their homework, and if they were like ten, it would be a bit more challenging. But I don't think it would be a problem for you. And uh, um, the other reason is that it's rare to find in a normal language school uh, people who are interested at the same time in ten languages. 
And of course, as uh, you all know, motivation is very important uh, uh, in, uh, so in, the, in terms of uh, success in learning the language. So, um, and as far as one-to-one -one classes are concerned, um, of course, you, we can imagine that people would be learning a uh, language much quicker, but uh, at the same time, it's much more tiring for both of them, for both the uh, teachers and students. But there is a real advantage, this is actually what I've just said, so that at, at least if it's like a one-to-one -one class, uh, you can choose the language you want to learn, and you are already motivated for that. So, um, some of you may be um, online teachers, and uh, um, what I think is that it's possible to teach multiple languages online. The only thing is that it's very, very important, much more, I think, than, than for other languages, that um, t uh, teachers do have uh, material, and actually very good uh, one. Uh, why? So, you know, like, online talking, sometimes you can have, like, informal tutoring, just be talking, which, which is fine, and I really like it. But for 10 languages, you do need to compare them and uh, to have a very clear structure. Otherwise, the, the mind gets a bit confused. And the second thing, I do think for online uh, teaching, you, you, need, you would need an excellent online uh, whiteboard. Because if you're writing multiple languages on the same board, whiteboard, then you need like uh, different colors. And, and students would be very confused if uh, if uh, there is only one color. And I, at the very least, many white words you cannot really switch it so quickly that the uh, the lesson doesn't get boring. So, so I also would like to show you what uh, some people think of these courses. So as you can see, so um, this student, so he's 64 years old, he has attended three uh, 10 language uh, courses and one three language uh, course. Uh, so he's speaking in German, but I, I wrote subtitles. This course makes a lot of Spaß. Uh, haben ganz viele Vorteile. Man lernt die Sprache nebeneinander, parallel, man kann sich Unterschiede und Gemeinsamkeiten besser merken. Äh, man lernt soziale Dinge, man lernt über die äh, einzelnen Länder und die Menschen. Und dadurch entwickelt sich ein ganz anderes soziales Verständnis und es werden Vorurteile abgebaut. Alles das sind Riesenvorteile dieser Mehrsprachigkeit. Äh, man kann sich auch besser Sachen merken. Es kommt unheimlich viel Spaß auf, auch in der Gruppe. Das wiederum führt dazu, dass im Gehirn ganz andere Synapsen gebildet werden und dass man sich Sachen viel, viel besser merken kann und dass man das auch besser behält und auch immer wieder in anderen Zusammenhängen anwenden kann. Okay. And now, uh, say, uh, second one, um, Astrid is uh, 37 years old and she's attending a five language course. Kannst du uns bitte sagen, was du über mehrsprachige Kurse denkst? Ja, ähm, ich konnte mir das gar nicht vorstellen, dass man mehrere Sprachen gleichzeitig lernen kann. Sicherlich, man muss seinen Kopf ein bisschen anstellen, man muss auch Hausaufgaben machen, was ich möglicherweise nicht oft genug mache, aber, aber es macht Spaß. Und das ist halt, das, für mich ist halt wichtig, wie der Unterricht auch gestaltet wird, ob man da halt mitgenommen wird oder ob das halt so ein stures Auge ist. Und ähm, ja, wenn wir hier sitzen in der Gruppe, das ist klasse, das ist so, man will halt immer reden und man lernt immer so Stück für Stück dazu, was man halt auch anwenden kann. Aber das ist, das ist ganz schön. Okay. What about the lesson structure? Of course, each class has different um, constraints. For example, if you are teaching in a school, um, they, might, may, um, they might tell you the class has to last one hour or two hours. But, uh, so, so these are my personal preferences. I really like, like I think they are enough, not like 90 minute uh, lessons for three language courses and uh, um, two hours, 15 minutes for a five language course. Um, the way la um, the lessons are structured are um, there is a certain amount of time for each language. Like here you see also 
for the other examples, like for a seven language course or a 10 language course, what they all have in common uh, is that, that there is a certain amount of time, like between 20 and 10 minutes according to the amount of languages, because the lesson cannot last five hours. Um, and then a common time to revise and compare all the languages, like more or less uh, 30 minutes. And I think that some of you might be thinking, 10 minutes for a language? For a language? Is it crazy? It's, it's crazy. So I wanted to show you, I, I taught one student for a, ta a Russian for 10 minutes, so I wanted to show you what he learned. And the student is not a polyglot, he's not a polyglot, he has never learned any Russian or any Slavic language. And uh, he, ha he had some Spanish and French at school about 15, 15 years ago. So, and this one was his uh, very first Russian lesson and lasted 10 minutes. Okay, so for the first lesson, I don't think in 10 minutes, I don't think it's too bad. I hope you think the same. Okay, what about language combination? I think any language combination is possible. Um, of course, there are advantages and disadvantages. As you may imagine, if they belong, if the languages belong to the same uh, family, of course, they are much easier to compare, and for the students, it would be much easier to pick them up. For example, when I explain um, verbs, so for example, present tense in for the three conjugations in Italian. It takes like 10 to 15 minutes to, uh, until they can use them uh, in short sentences without me uh, helping them all the time. And, but when I uh, switch to Spanish, it takes them like half of the time. And then when I switch to French, which is similar but not identical, it takes even less time. So this is why I mean that it's possible to learn more than one language at the same time and actually for the same amount of time, many, many languages. Uh, there is a disadvantage, but actually only for the teacher, because uh, teachers have to um, uh, repeat constantly differences until they are really automatic, so until they can really separate the languages. But uh, it's, I think it's normal in a language class. And if they belong to a different family, uh, I personally I think it's much easier to separate, to keep them separate, separate in the brain. And uh, uh, of course, at the beginning, it takes more time uh, to remember words. But actually, as you know, just at the beginning, because after a while, you can remember them much, much easier, um, much more easy. And I do think it's possible to find many um, similarities, even in languages which uh, don't have anything in common. So like from, from the point of view of the family. And so the teacher should be a bit creative in that sense. So what about the method? So first of all, the, one of the most important things in order, to no, no, in order to train them not to mix up the languages is the uh, language switching. So for example, of course not uh, in the first uh, minute, but after I taught like uh, uh, three languages for uh, at the very least like uh, 15 minutes each, then I can say, for example, how do you say I work in uh, Russian, fr uh, French and Spanish, for example, or how do you say and in four languages, for example, um, uh, in Spanish, Portuguese, uh, Catalan, uh, French, Italian, they are very similar in a way, so it's very difficult, so those small words to, uh, to remember, not to, to say well, or y, pero, también, and so. Okay, and uh, so language switching, or a bit more uh, for, um, you can say, um, can you please, uh, uh, someone said something in one language, and, and you can say, can you repeat that in another language? Or can you uh, repeat what your uh, classmate said in another language? And 
um, and also believe that it's very important that uh, students learn um, how to ask questions all the time because I think in most classes they they listen uh, and they um, if they are so if there are good teachers they can speak but they are normally not um, familiar with asking so many questions and I think actually especially for beginners it's so good they can ask a question and then don't say anything and just listen so they can actually uh, learn much more and uh, so what I do especially for beginner classes many uh, so students ask each other questions uh, in different languages and of course uh, students have to answer in the same language the question was asked so they have to first recognize the language and then use it and I wanted to show you how um, what I meant by asking uh, several questions in different languages. So in this case, so this I recorded before the Russian one. Um, as I told you, this person has learned French and Spanish 15 years ago, and he has uh, uh, had two Italian lessons before. So and here are the results. Yes, machen wir eine so alle drei Sprachen zusammen. Come si dice? Fünf auf Italienisch, Spanisch und Französisch. Sehr gut. Wie sagt man, ich bin Deutsche in alle drei Sprachen? So, Tedesco, so, Wie sagt man, ich wohne in Düren? Fast dasselbe, aber eine andere Position. Mhm. Französisch mit dem Verb habiter. Mhm. Wie sagt man, kochen in alle drei Sprachen? Das ist ein bisschen wie Italienisch, aber mit, äh, mit der spanischen Aussprache. Sehr gut. Sehr schön. Vielen Dank. So, next question. Is it only for language experts? So, I don't think so. Most of my students are between 35 and 65 years old. Uh, what I think um, is that it's very important that they are open and curious uh, to other languages and cultures. They should have studied at least one language, foreign language before, uh, although it's not necessary, uh, so they don't have to um, speak it uh, perfectly. Um, and they have to have some free time. So I think no one has free time, but we have to find at least five years. But I think we have to find five minutes every day because of course I cannot, um, we cannot expect uh, students to come to our class and then uh, one week later without having done uh, anything remembering five or ten languages. So what I normally say, five minutes a day are enough, are enough, why? So I will uh, say that uh, a bit later. So remember that. And I wanted to show you now a group with, uh, so they had uh, three lessons in five languages. Okay, so as I said, they are not polyglots, so don't expect like the best performance ever, but I think that um, to start with is not bad. Come ti chiami? Mi chiamo Mirza. Come ti t'appelle? Uh, <laughs> je suis <laughs> Sofia. <laughs> Dove vivi? Vi vivo in Herzogenrat. Uh, auf Italienisch nicht N, sondern für eine Stadt immer? A. Ah. Vivo a Herzogenrat. Um, come si dice wie heißt du auf Italienisch? Come ti chiami? Mm -hmm. Und wie würdest du antworten? Mi chiamo Lea. Sehr gut. Dove? <lacht> Deshalb? Zusammen? Dove vivi? Dove vivi? Und wie würdest du antworten? Uh, vivo a Herzogenrat. Sehr gut. Ich uh, bitte U. Uh, <lacht> Mm -hmm. Aber Französisch ist wie Italienisch. Wie sagt man dieses, äh, welche Präposition? 
Uh, ja, mm -hmm. uh, komme ich Ich spreche Italienisch, uh, Deutsch, Französisch und Portugiesisch. Um, parlo Italiano, Tedesco, mm -hmm. Franz. Italienische Aussprache? CE, italienische Aussprache? Um, Francese. Ja. Ähm, Portugese. Und jetzt habe ich vergessen. Katalan. <lacht> Catalano. <lacht> äh, kannst du mir bitte sagen, und in alle fünf Sprachen? Ähm, e in Italienisch, Französisch und Portugiesisch und I in Spanisch und Katalanisch. Sehr gut. Wie sagt man, ich arbeite viel auf Italienisch? Lavoro molto. Lavoro molto. Und auf Spanisch? Ähm, um, lavoro molto. Sehr gut. Okay. The second uh, method, uh, sorry, they are all, uh, let's say, at the same time. Uh, comparing languages. Um, of, it's, um, so the important thing is to highlight the differences. So, for example, uh, for languages which are very similar, like French, Italian, Spanish, uh, to highlight, in that case, I was explaining like how to use the article for uh, to, to express a regular activity. And so I would explain in Italian and French are very uh, similar in that respect, and Spanish uh, actually is quite logical because it's regular activity so many times, so plural, and I compare them. Or I compare uh, verbs and words, so I use such um, tables, but so it was much bigger. So it's, uh, he has just uh, like the uh, first uh, three verbs, either to compare um, words or to uh, conjugate <coughs> the same verbs in different uh, languages. And um, yeah, so this one was about the daily routine. And I wanted to show you, so for those who are not familiar with Italian and Spanish, maybe it looks like Arabic or Chinese, but otherwise it's, um, um, so it's way I normally explain the logic of verb conjugations uh, between uh, um, Italian and Spanish. So you see the letters which are uh, recurrent and, uh, what, um, and why they are, um, for example, in Italian called are, ere, ire conjugation and the same for Spanish. And I also compare uh, pronunciation. Of course, pronunciation, of course, is not possible. And I normally suggest to, in the first lesson, to say everything, you say all the rules, yes. But what I think is very important, again, is to compare uh, pronunciation in the languages you are teaching. So this chart was not about all the rules in all languages, but was more about the, 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 the things these languages have in common, like, for example, they have the CI, uh, like in Italian is C, in uh, uh, Spanish C, and in, uh, um, in French is then C. So, and to uh, uh, highlight it and to um, reiterate it so that they can uh, keep it uh, um, in mind. And so this chart just explains really the things they have somehow in common, but which are actually different. <coughs> of course, the other important part is describing language features. Um, so that they, of course, polyglots maybe wouldn't have this problem, but let's say a person who has never seen Italian and uh, Spanish or another language uh, um, before, uh, to, to, to keep them separate. Uh, so, for example, explaining that Italian words almost never end uh, in a consonant. So, for example, they say vivi or uh, vives, so which one uh, can be Italian, only the one with a um, um, vowel at the end, the other one can only be Spanish, for example, or um, in the case of French, explain, for example, that um, when you write French, it's quite complicated, but when you especially present for ER verbs, it's very easy, you just say parle for the, the first, so for the first three and the last one, so just uh, uh, emphasizing uh, things which uh, will make a student's life easier and of course, rate rate differences all the time. Uh, here another example, for example, uh, people when they count, since they have very similar numbers, they keep confu confusing them. 
but actually say or they think oh, I can remember um, three in Spanish and then I would say it's like Italian but just with an S or the opposite um, or in the same it's for pronunciation for example quattro in Italian is very important they do quattro because double consonants are very important in Italian otherwise for example if you say tonno or tono it's one is a tuna fish, the other one is the tone of the voice. So it's very important double consonant in Italian. And uh, um, so reiterate those differences for them. Homework. Um, so I, will, I told you that I would uh, go back to this five minutes, um, five minutes a day. And I think uh, it's very important, not because five minutes are really enough, but they are first of all enough for the beginning. Because I think if you tell uh, your students, Yes, please, learn five hours a day a language. So no one has the time and they would even start. It's so hard. So if you build a habit and you study every day for five minutes, after a while it, it becomes so natur and, uh, um, natural that you don't even have to think about it. And the second thing is, actually it's a bit like a trick, but if you tell your students to study for five minutes, uh, when they start seeing uh, that they are improving, then we study more than five minutes, so it's good. The second thing is that um, write, uh, about writing. So I, then I never asked to write anything in the classroom, and I'm not talking about notes, I'm talking about like exercises, because I think it's very important to, that they do it as homework, because on one hand it's very important self-study and they, they, they think about the differences in the language, and then they, there is no uh, waste of time during the lesson. I also ask sometimes if they are just our uh, topic like a written verb conjugation. I don't normally ask for word lists, so it's really up to the student. I don't personally enjoy so much making word lists, so it's up to the student. Everyone learns a language in a different way. If it helps, why not? But I normally provide with uh, word lists. Uh, but I also notice that if I provide all the lists, the students will make no effort and they will learn less. So. Sometimes I don't give them to, uh, to them. Okay, what about uh, if you are teaching or if you learn uh, languages uh, which have a different alphabet? I really think it's still possible. Uh, what I what I suggest is that um, in order for the student to get rid of the mental block, like ah oh, no, I will never be able to speak this language or pronunciation is so difficult. I really think they should have fun with the language and uh, um, they should be uh, speaking this language from the very beginning. Uh, it's a bit like I showed uh, for Russian. And I also think it's better not to learn pr um, how to write in the very first lesson because uh, once you can uh, read, you, can, you will be influenced by the way you pronounce those words uh, in your mother tongue. So it's much better just to hear pronunciation first and then, um, and then learn how to write. Of course, not like then lessons uh, later, but just not necessarily as the first thing. What about course material? I mostly use self-made uh, material because not, there are no course books uh, on the topic. But I'm writing uh, mine, so on different um, uh, language combinations, so these ones. And I, um, but you may also want to use similar books published uh, in different languages. Uh, the advantage is that, of course, it's, uh, you can use them, it's, they are very uh, easy to use in the classroom and easy to compare. Um, and they're normally very nice. The advantage is that personally I'm a bit of a visual learner, learner so for me it would be too difficult to see like the same page in 10 languages. It, it also a bit boring. So I'll show you what I mean. So, um, so page 10 from a book and uh, it's uh, so you have the same in this case for French, Italian and Spanish but they also have like uh, uh, also for English for example. And uh, um, it's nice, it's very nice to compare for three languages, but I wouldn't really suggest for like five or six or seven or so. Of course, you can also use normal good course books. Uh, they're, of course, easy to find. But uh, the only thing is that I would really avoid to use them, of course, from the first page to, uh, to, to the end. And the most important thing is that I think at the very beginning students should learn more or less the same words in each language. Otherwise, you cannot compare the languages. You cannot say, how do you say that in Spanish, uh, uh, Turkish and Portuguese if they have never learned it? So I um, 
so I would use them, but I would really um, pick up just uh, some parts. So I wouldn't just buy one book, but a couple of photocopies if it's allowed. And I also want to show you another page. Where it's, uh, it's taken from a children's book, and I um, like very much. So it's uh, for Russian, uh, and with the translation in, into German. In German. And you can use it, for example, at the beginning to uh, to um, um, yeah to train simple structures like I like or I don't like, and it's uh, quite uh, straightforward. So something similar I was suggesting. Least but not last, so teach, uh, I wanted to talk about teacher skills. What I think, of course, is that teachers should be able to uh, switch from one language to another. It's very important. Otherwise, how can they do that? and they should be able to compare languages in a very clear way <coughs> and find similar <coughs> similarities between languages even if they do not belong to the same family um, and being very patient. Of course, be very patient any teacher in any, for any language course but here, since I have to repeat the same thing ever and ever again I think it's even more important and the same is that, I don't know, it depends on the country where you will be teaching in but for example, I say so I teach in Germany, and uh, it's um, for I, I. My impression is that the uh, audios uh, really would like to achieve uh, excellence from the first uh, very uh, first day, and uh, they like to be like perfect in that sense. And uh, so you should motivate them, encourage, encourage them much more because they are not used anymore. Like in my case, they are uh, they're not polyglots. They don't normally study languages. So they they need a bit more encour encouragement uh, when, so when learning uh, five languages at the same time, for example. And of course, a very nice atmosphere. It's important in every course, but it should be very inter interactive because they cannot just listen uh, to you explaining uh, dif um, say different languages. They really should use them because, as you have seen in, in uh, the uh, lesson structure, there are not so many minutes for each language, if you just talk, like me in this moment, but if you just talk, then they will not be using the language very much, which is, then they cannot learn it very well. So, at the very beginning I told you about uh, students' advantages, and now I would like to uh, talk about, so, since it's more difficult, such, uh, so much, uh, so more work, why, uh, why teachers should uh, choose uh, teaching more than one language at the same time? So, in my case, for example, is also because I live, I don't live in a big city, so I am really happy to use uh, my languages um, in my classes. Also, it's very interesting, very challenging, it's something new, and it's nice to be, uh, to, to offer something that um, you cannot find everywhere. And uh, in general, students, uh, also in language uh, schools, students pay more for those classes, uh, so not so much more, but uh, definitely more. And so, if, as a teacher, if it's uh, also important to you, you can also get a higher salary. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. And uh, so, uh, please feel, feel free to ask any question uh, uh, you may have. Yes. <laughs> Where can you go to this? What do you think? Where do I go to attend one of these? <laughs> Where I teach, I, I, uh, I teach in uh, Aachen, mm -hmm. Germany. Yeah. That's a little bit far from me. I live in Austria. Yeah, Is there online. anywhere closer? <laughs> online. online. <laughs> you can pay the flight to Norway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, I was I was also asking: um, Is there a possibility on the on the internet to look up um, where these courses are offered? I mean, in, in Berlin, there probably are courses like this. Is there a certain website you could recommend? Or? Sorry, uh, I cannot be an expert for every anything in the world. So I don't live in Berlin. I, I know that there are courses in Berlin, uh, in big cities like Berlin and Frankfurt, and uh, also uh, sorry, some other cities in Germany. I know that there are, but I just know them at Volkshochschule, so I, I'm not sure online. So it's something new. So it's not that there are thousand teachers uh, offering that. So it's possible, but I, can, I uh, unfortunately cannot su uh, suggest uh, or recommend a certain website. 
I think maybe if you just uh, um, so in some years or in some months maybe maybe if many of you would like to do then you can find many but uh, I'm sure you can find them but I just I could just name some Volkshochschule were uh, so like in Berlin where do you live in Berlin yes ah, okay so there are, uh, uh. there are Volkshochschule where uh, so they offer it I've seen it in the program which one you're asking me too much. Okay. I don't know. No, a, a second question. Uh, my second question would be: um, You have um, showed pupils or students who are beginners, more or less, in those languages. Most of us are polyglots. I know. Uh, so, so uh, would you also recommend such a course for polyglots, or yeah, I, because you have the different I, levels? Of course, everybody yes. has a different level. Actually, I think that. Um, I think it's a, a very good for any level because let's say instead of doing something like basic uh, that I was showing, you can have a text and then you can say, okay, now um, what was written in the text, you just explain what was written there, like I don't know, in French, and then the teacher can tell you, and now can you explain it in Portuguese? And then it's a very good train, training, and then of course if, if the teacher is good, they, they will insist on the, uh, so they will highlight the difference in the rate, the rate of the differences. Thank you. I was wondering how you're dealing with uh, the different levels of students, especially if you have a course for five languages, ten languages, then I would assume that uh, a few of your students are already intermediate level in uh, one of the languages. Maybe one student is intermediate in it uh, Italian and beginner in Spanish and French, and the other person is intermediate in French, and the others are beginners in the other. So how do you deal with that? Um, Say, so it happens. Fortunately, it's not. Uh, I told you that in, um, where I teach is not. That I don't normally have polyglots. So normally there is maybe one person who knows one language quite well. So I think in my case, my experience, they are quite happy. They are not bored. Why? First of all, because uh, they can relax uh, <laughs> uh, 15 minutes uh, per lesson, which is also nice. If your brain is really already boiling because you are trying to absorb every, everything. On the other hand, they also help each other because they are kind of an example to the other, so it's not bad. Of course, if you are already um, fluent in five languages, you go to a seven language course, doesn't make any sense. It's too boring for you if you go to a basic course. So, but if more, if uh, uh, your level is quite good in one language and the other four or five or seven are not like uh, your best. Uh, 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 languages, then I, I, I don't think it's a problem at all. And for example, in my case, I if I see that someone is too good, uh, or two or three, I put them, for example, also together, and I give something easier to the other ones, and something more difficult for them, more challenging. It depends on what they want to do, or uh, whether they prefer... Some people come to, uh, come to courses uh, also for the atmosphere, so they prefer to do everything together with the others, and some others are very eager to learn, and then in that case, then I prefer to separate exercises. But, yeah. Just quickly, because you said to, to separate them in groups, how many students do you even have in, in each class? So it depends. So I have from, uh, so of course, apart from one to one classes, I have normally from six to 17. <coughs> so it's not, not my choice. If the school says 17, I do 10. <laughs> eh? Actually, it's one of my best classes. Because uh, they are first, they don't feel alone. They know that they're doing not they're doing together. They can um, uh, train in, in couples all the time, so they can speak a lot. And they um, one knows one thing, one knows more uh, the other thing, and together they help each other very much. So I really say I'm I was surprised as well, but it works very well. I would like to ask about all the methods that we can learn many languages in uh, different. Uh, Approaches that there are. Uh, I prefer like Michel Thomas method that had ten languages. You prefer Michel Thomas method had also many. It was ten languages like uh, in Spanish, uh, French, and Polish had the method, but also there are related to some of Spanish. But what is the the, the big uh, contribution of your classes that could be quantity, not quality, or quality, not quantity? How people can also improve their quality of this language at the same time? This could be also helpful if they can reach the advanced level in all these uh, 10 languages at the same time. It could be possible. So, um, I said that I would dedicate the same amount of time for each language. Yeah. So, uh, what, what is important is not to neglect any language so that you reach 
the same level in each language. Otherwise, you at a certain point, you cannot compare them anymore if they are very fluent in one and very bad in the other. So it's very important to keep all of them. This why, at the very beginning, I explained that in each class, I, um, I teach all the languages every time. So it's not that uh, today we do French and Spanish and next week, because normally my course is off just once a week. So it's not really that uh, you cannot not see one language for two weeks, it's impossible. So it's every time, the same amount of time, and then the same amount of time to revise them and compare them all the time. Okay, okay thanks so much. So what recommendations would you have if this were to be done as self-study, if say a group of a group of students got together and uh, polyglots got together and decided let's learn five languages at a time in the, essentially this fashion, but we don't have a teacher, we're just going to be doing it ourselves. Say uh, for polyglots, I think it's possible. At the same time, say um, it depends also on. Uh, there are polyglots who can really explain something about languages and there are polyglots who are super fluent and maybe uh, just are so into the language that they cannot explain it anymore, they learned it a long time ago, so I cannot know uh, w uh, so uh, w uh, what people you had in mind. But at the same time, the important part is, of, of course, that anyone contributes with the languages they know and then you ask each other all the time, so switching from one language to the other. The only thing which could be missing if you are not able, so not able, but if you are not used to, uh, to comparing the languages, is the comparing part, which is very important to keep them separate. But if you already speak them uh, um, um, up to a certain level, maybe you already separate them, you just want to learn them quicker and, uh, more, um, and it's possible. So I think it's uh, comparing, so the method I would just uh, recommend the same thing, so language switching, comparing, describing features, but then it depends uh, really on the actual people you have in mind. <laughs> Elisa, thank you very much for your talk, I really enjoyed it a lot. And I would love to know, when are you going to publish your books? <laughs> Same. But it's not really a question, is it? Yeah, it's a yeah? question. Okay. <laughs> because I want one of your books. Okay. So I'm writing, say, for French, for French, uh, Spanish and Italian. So I think within this year. Oh, we should buy it. Yeah. I, I just wanted to know, um, because what I, what I didn't really understand is how come people, I mean, we all love to learn languages, and we all love to learn any kind of language, language probably, how come you have people choosing a course, say, learning Italian, Spanish, French, and Russian at the same time? Mm -hmm. So, could you elaborate a bit on the... Um, on the remind, what they have in mind? Yes, I can try. Yeah, Not in their mind. yeah. so from my experience, what I... What I've seen is that there are many people who like traveling and just travel everywhere. And sometimes it happens, that's why I said that, not, uh, that for people who are not polyglot or are not really language free, freak, I would, under, I, would, I would say that uh, it would be better uh, not to have 10 languages in one course because people cannot be 100% interested in all languages, as you say. But uh, it happened, for example, I can say that in one of my uh, five language courses where um, at the beginning people were not really interested in one language because I ask when I, before starting, I say, okay, you're in this course, so what are the languages you're more, uh, most interested in? And, or, and why are you here? Why are you, um, uh, uh, why did you, why have you decided to do something like that? And uh, sometimes they say, ah, I really am not really interested in this language. But then since we do it all the time, and uh, sometimes I, I, when I know that the person, if I know that this person has already studied it, really doesn't want to study it, then I can, I ask, okay, do you, uh, do you want to participate or do you want to do something else in, uh, when, while you're doing uh, this language? But as you have seen, it's just, 15 or 20 minutes per language, so it's not too long. Uh, and uh, the second thing is that sometimes people um, say that they don't like something because they've never done it. So sometimes I, and I keep asking the same person for the same language they didn't want to learn, and at a certain point they say, but I like it. <laughs> 
So, and as far as Russian, I think it depends. Sometimes it's because they travel a lot, and sometimes it's because they think it's very interesting to learn many languages at the same time. They want to know about the method, whether, why, um, and uh, whether it's possible. So at the beginning they're interested, and then, uh, and so this is more or less, but. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I'm curious how you handle cultural differences and, and things that are, are specific to each language. Like when you're at, when you're teaching something like my name is mm -hmm. this or I'm from this country. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it works to to do this comparative method. But then, what about when the students get to a point where it's helpful for them to really learn things specific to Italian and Italian culture or French and French culture or Russian Ru Russian culture that doesn't uh, make sense. Can you give an example? Uh, not off the top of my head, but I know that it's, it's happened and it's something that I've experienced more because I also speak Mandarin where there are just words that I just, it's not that I can't say them in other languages, mm -hmm. it's that I wouldn't talk about them in mm -hmm. other languages. So I'm just curious yeah. how you handle that. So, I don't think it's a real problem because actually people who come to those courses are people open and curious who would like to learn about other cultures and actually uh, the um, cultural differences um, from my point of view are one of the most interesting things in learning languages. So they, um, when I explain for example, in, in Italy you cannot uh, say, I say, do you want to go to the cinema tomorrow? And then I say, no, can it sight? Yeah. So for Italians, it's like, <laughs> no, I'm sorry, I cannot. I have to go, I have to work. Yeah, something like that. So it's also fun. So the they don't, uh, and or, as, so this one, as far, as far as cultural differences are concerned, they are interested, they are open, they want to know that, even if they don't, um, I don't know, if, if they don't want to travel there. there. But as far as uh, really like the language and the words, so they don't have to learn five dictionaries uh, like 100%. At the beginning, it's very important only because they have to learn to separate them. But then they can learn, uh, as I said, for example, you can take a text for in a certain language and work on that language, and then a, a text with a cultural a specific thing to another language, and the words are not the same. It depends on the level. At the very beginning, it's important that they learn the same words. But then, of course, and, uh, you... Uh, um, for example, if you're uh, speaking in, in Italy, if you are in Italy, you speak, uh, you talk about food all the time. If you are uh, in Germany, uh, so in my experience, be about many things, but also about what is not working all the time. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so in each uh, country, you have a different uh, topic. Or when I was living in Moscow, all the time, uh, you know how I go to work by car. I go, I take this road and then this road. Of course, I wouldn't be saying that in another language. And I think it's a uh, very interesting. And also, uh, you can. This why you also have a separate amount of time for each language. And the the, the higher the level gets, the, the more you can uh, do go more into the direction of uh, cultural uh, specific uh, specific things. Uh, yes, one question here. <clears throat> after one year of student, your students after mm -hmm. one year of one hour per week, which level more or less they have they reach? I think you also may imagine that it depends on so many things. So one thing would be teaching to polyglots. One thing to be teaching to people who normally say who haven't seen any foreign language in 20 years. It really depends. So um, the method is about learning in the same amount of time. Um, so everyone knows in you know, how, mu how much time we would learn a language. And you should imagine the same amount of time you would use for a certain language instead of one, let's say five. But it's really in, a, in it depends if you do your homework. If you never open your book, not, sorry, no, no, so many results, no, so much, uh, yeah, no, so many results. But if you uh, if you work five minutes every day and you come to classes, I, so I uh, in my classes normally you learn a lot. I don't I don't want them to go home and say I've, I've said the same things ever and ever again. So repeating yes, but something new as well. So it really depends and depends on the motivation. And everything so it's very hard to define that but uh, I think 
for example, if you want to, to learn many languages at the same time, you are motivated, you can reach a good level. But it depends really on also a certain point, I don't know. So I believe that at the very beginning, teachers are very important, especially for people who are not used to learn languages. But after a certain, for a certain level, people have to study a lot on their own as well, to reach really to pass, for example, from B1 to B2, or from B2 to C1. Lots of self-study is necessary, you cannot do everything in the class, so it depends. So we saw mainly beginners in the videos that you had, and I was just wondering, up to what level do you usually teach these classes? Um, teaching in Germany, I must say that most of the time, um, so they are, uh, so I have many beginner classes. When I was teaching in Russia, I have many advanced classes. So it depends also on the um, how so in that, uh, how many people in that seat your area have lear already learned the language so but um, so i have more beginner classes or intermediate than advanced this and also because when people are really very good normally they study on their own um i just wanted where did you get the idea from um i went to um to a very short course so from a person who was doing that and uh, um, I was interested, so in the course, I, there are certain things that which I thought that were very interesting, but then I developed my own way of teaching it. So I went to a short course, like three days course. One thing I was worried and wondering about was um, the fact that, well, when I went to school, I went to a, a certain school that rated languages by level of difficulty. And so you had mentioned that Russian is one of the ones that, that get taught there. And I was just wondering that if you do a class that has languages, some that are seemingly easier to a German speaker and some of them who are harder to a German speaker, do they normally keep the same level mm -hmm. at the end of the class? Say the question then. <laughs> Sorry if I wasn't clear. Um, let's say... Um, so if the level at the end are, uh, is the same in each language? Well, is what all right. Uh, for instance, yesterday, I can't remember which uh, lecture it was, but one person was talking about how um, for an average French speaker, Russian would take so many more hours okay. than German and so many more hours than German with so many more hours than Spanish, right? Mm -hmm. And I went to a school in the U.S. that rated the languages by Spanish being a one, yeah, uh, okay. German so being a two, you know, like that. Mm -hmm. So, okay. so how do you keep those if you're if somebody is studying a, a harder language mm -hmm. together with an easier language? How do you keep them on the same level? So, um, honestly, I think it's possible. Uh, it's always possible to make a different language much easier, and it's why I really like and really enjoy teaching Russian and German. I really like, and so I like teaching French, Spanish, and Italian. But I really enjoy teaching difficult languages because I think sometimes uh, they look very difficult, but it's possible to make them much easier. Um, so for students, but it's true that, for example, when I was studying in the UK, I I went to a Spanish class, and for me it was like learning. Uh, so I w didn't need to study anything, I was already, not because I'm intelligent or anything, just because of the language differences, I, 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 I didn't have to study and I was uh, still better uh, than people in the class who studied, because uh, for, uh, as you said, for uh, English uh, native speakers, Spanish is more difficult than for Italians. But, um, so what I think is that, what, you, what I try at least is first uh, to um, so it depends also on their motivation, but it's possible. You just keep um, not. Uh, how can I explain? So uh, what I mean is that you can um, a cert at a certain point it's more difficult when you are really reading texts and something like that. But before that, actually there are easy uh, things in all the languages and even in Russian and something like that. So I I. Was never a problem for me. I understand your point, 
but it was never a problem because I, I dedicated the, uh, amount, a certain amount of time, all the time, for that language. And then I, if I see that it's much more difficult than the others, I, when I do the comparing part, the rate of reading part, I, I um, say I insist more on that part instead of the other languages. They are really clear. I, I, I try to reiterate much more what is difficult.